So, hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I am Emily Moyer from Off Planet Media, and I am going to have a conversation with a new friend today. We've chatted a couple of times on Facebook and in the background, and it always feels really nice when somebody requests to have a conversation with you because they think you're weird or interesting or whatever it is. And so Darren did that. And, and I'll be quite honest, like uh, I've, I've listened to Darren on some shows for a while, and I always like the things he has to say. I was concerned about doing a show with him because I felt that the challenge of people having to alternately listen to one of the fastest talkers on the YouTube and one of the slower, slowest talkers on the YouTube <laughs> might prove challenging, but we're in strange times and people are flexing their abilities here and learning new skills and whatnot. So I will try and speak at a more human pace and maybe Darren will try and speak at a more bumblebee type pace like me and uh, we'll have... <laughs> We'll have a conversation, and um, uh, I'm gonna. We kind of started as this always happens before the recording, and Darren started doing all the good stuff before we started. So I told him he was gonna have to redo this whole skit. So, Darren Williams, welcome. How you doing? I'm doing great. It's lovely in Liverpool today. It's really, really sunny, very, very unseasonably weather. It was sometimes it's raining, but all this week it's been really, really California type weather. Ah, okay, enough. Do your usual thing. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you for trying. So, <laughs> so, so basically what it is, I'm glad Emily, in a very ESP manner, went to a point I was going to go at, and that is how I talk. Mm -hmm. Now, we are part of this lovey-dovey alternative research community, and that means we deal with all types of horrific things from Freemasonic sex cults, known as in America, I think they're known as the jesters, they wear feathers, and um, the, we've got a, another realm of Freemasonry, which women can only join, called the Star of the East, I believe. The Eastern so, Star, yeah. Ten points for Emily. So because of that, we deal with these very disturbing notions. But when I go on podcasts, people say, I don't like how that guy talks. And I'm like, how are we going to change the world? If the first thing mm -hmm. you can think of is how I speak, mm -hmm. what my cadence is, my rhythm, the tone of it, you should be more bothered about what is the feeling and emotion that I am saying combined with the factual information and combined with the high octane speculation to rip off Joseph Farrell's saying. So, Previous to this, Emily, I was a guest on Robert Phoenix's show. I remember. And me and him were having a really good conversation. It was riffing really good, as Robert would say. And they had a woman in the chat room, which is on the side of the YouTube, and I was just paying attention. And she just says, I don't like him. He's boring. His voice is boring. And I'm like, oh, well, just watch CNN and watch people that are trained to speak in a way that programs your head. Mm -hmm. the, the, Cuomo, Don Lemon, those people, even Carlson Tucker, those people have gone through extensive neural linguistic programming, which <laughs> means when they speak, it goes into that noodle of yours like a snake, and yep. it stays there. So if you want somebody with a perfect pitch, don't listen to Emily anymore, don't certainly listen to me, all you've got to do is put that box on and it's either CNN or it's Fox and you'll be happy forever. So that is my first little rant. My, my second one is Emily and Robert were in a great conversation talking about sports and I believe she, uh, Emily was talking about her passion being that of tennis and uh, Rafa Nadal and Djokovic and Roger Federer, that, tri that trifecta that is very interesting and epic. And it got on to soccer and Robert just said, I don't like soccer. And Emily then said, neither do I. I think it's boring. And I was like, what? Oh, what's going on? Because I, I love both of them. This is the first time I've actually spoken to Emily. And I was like really, really gutted. But at the same time, they've got a right to like what they like. 
So what I have done in defense of soccer, because Liverpool are currently the European champions of soccer, <laughs> um, I have worn this vintage, hard to find Liverpool alternative top from 1993. Just look at it, people. Just look at it. <laughs> Just look at that I think you missed your calling as a model, Darren. <laughs> well, it was either go after the Freemasons or go on the catwalk in Paris. And I chose the one that didn't pay me any money. <laughs> so so that's it. So um, that is the sort of housekeeping of it. But Emily, uh, before she pressed record, talked about her working in a in a South American, Latin American bar that just showed a uh, soccer constantly. And I have lived in London around that community. And I thought Scousers, that's my people with my boring accents, live. And uh, I'm not bitter, by the way, man, I'm not bitter. And um, I thought we were intense about the game of soccer, but when you meet somebody from South America, uh -huh. that is next level passion. That is grown men crying out of defeat, tears of agony, or of a victory, tears of joy. Yeah. And, and when I was in London, like one example was Brazil was playing Chile in a World Cup. Um, knockout elimination round 16 when the World Cup was in Brazil and it was an epic game and it went to penalties and Brazil just about sneaked through and it was like an episode of The Simpsons one minute everybody's biting the nails and as soon as the winning penalty comes the guitars come out and the bongos <laughs> what is going on here? Like, dun, 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 and then the barman's like, "Yeah, everyone, three cocktails." I take this cocktail, and Joe Rogan goes on about DMT. I was seeing the past, present, and future at the same time for about three minutes. <laughs> was it ayahuasca? What was happening? <laughs> I don't know. I think it was more uh, Escobar. I think that would last for, for 13 hours. Oh, I got you. An Escobar. All right. and, uh, can I have an Escobar, please? So I don't gotcha. know, but that, that blew my nuggets. I was dancing. I can't even play the bongos, and I was playing them brilliantly, I think. Yeah. So. <laughs> you, you, think you, it, you think being the key thing there. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things Emily talked about was how she loves tennis because it has a mystic uh, basis to it. And I can actually top that, I believe, because the game of soccer was invented by Freemasons in ah. a Freemasonic pub in London. Ah. And the reason why we have 11, when it first started, a team consisted of 11 players with no substitute, and you had a manager that equals 12. And then every club has an owner, which equals 13. So Jesus had 12 disciples mm. and he was in charge. So that is them using the biblical background of the disciples to put into a team. Interesting. Well, it, it, there are some similarities between soccer and and tennis in that they're you know that they're both played originally on a lawn, right? And there's geometry, uh, you know, it's set up geometrically in a way, and it is the um, passing in various ways of a ball back and forth and whatnot kind of thing. So there are some similarities. The soccer ball does have obviously the black and white patching on it, sort of like a masonic floor as well. Um, yeah, I can see that. I, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I literally have probably uh, spent maximum seven minutes of my life, uh, other than trying to, you know, argue with the people at the uh, Peruvian restaurant that I worked at because I wanted to watch tennis and they wanted to watch soccer. So we would kind of have a battle back and forth. And, and yeah, it was, it, it really was tough. But fortunately, they're often played at different times. Uh, right. And we just got into a place where we agreed that the person whose thing was happening live 
had preference had you know precedence over the person who was watching us and think it was pre-recorded or, or had already happened or whatever right but uh, they they won more often than i did we finally got a second television that was a smaller one so i would kind of watch tennis there and that was fine so i haven't spent a lot of time knowing or understanding why it is fascinating to observe like you said the passions of the people the supporters of these t uh, teams and, and not just not just in south america in europe as well uh, as well um but I, I agree with you watching the 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 fans in south america is like watching people at a michael jackson concert in the 80s who would just cry when he would come out on stage and it was like bizarre i mean just the, like the women would pass out and whatnot and like michael jackson's a good dancer and stuff he has some good tunes and stuff like that but i don't necessarily feel emotional when i see him so to see people you know have that kind of response and it's that same kind of response with the latin americans in soccer that really just oh my god i can't believe that i'm here seeing this and this is what's happening and all that jazz that's the only thing i can compare it to so let's talk about michael jackson Real quickly, before we do that, hold Michael Jackson, I want to say one thing. I want to thank you for addressing the issue about the way we speak with humor, because that's kind of what, I mean, I've been criticized a lot. It's less now, because I've, I, you know, for me, it was just getting used to speaking on camera. I still speak quickly, but I used to stutter a lot more and, get, you know, much my train of thought would get interrupted and I'd interrupt and this and that. And, and I still do sometimes, but I felt the same way, like, you know, the content of what I was saying was more important than, you know, how perfectly, you know, presented I, yeah, how, how perfectly I presented it. Um, and I took a lot of criticism and a lot of people made fun of me. There was a lot of comments in the YouTube section and whatever. And for me, it just helped me to sort of thicken my skin. And when people offered uh, constructive criticism, I appreciated it because I've always been trying to get better at doing this. Um, but, you know, a lot of people just always want to have something to say. And to your point about uh, the professionals being trained in NLP, absolutely, right? You know, if you ever have listened to uh, this radio station we have here in, in the United States called NPR, National Public Radio, like they speak in this really weird way that I don't even understand. And every time they interview somebody, like that person suddenly talks like that too, even though if you hear them interviewed on something else, they sound like a normal person. So it's a severe mind control that is almost just like, as soon as you sort of connect with that web of something or other, suddenly you're doing that too. And it is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a programming tool. And I even have a cousin who once just admitted to me that she knows what he says is bullshit, but she loves listening to Barack Obama talk. She just can't help it. It just makes her feel so good. I enlightened her to neuro-linguistic programming. So my point with all of this is, is that like we're all here having these conversations and some of us are putting ourselves out in front of people instead of just being keyboard warriors or bloggers or commenters or whatever, because we think it's important to talk to other people. And we do that you know, with the, with the understanding that we may <laughs> receive some criticism for our imperfections because of that. And I honor you for continuing to speak anyway, because you do have interesting things to say and you have a wonderful sense of humor as we just got to witness. So thank you for that. I think, um, you know, it's important that we, that we do this and that we sort of, you know, overcome whatever little issues we have with people to really hear what they're saying. You know what I mean? And it doesn't just go for like stylistic things. Sometimes it goes for, we have certain disagreements with people, but there's something else they're saying that may be important to us. And we have to be able to go, okay, I don't like when they do this. So I don't like when they talk about this in the way that they do, because I disagree, but there's something else they're saying. So I need to put that aside for a minute and listen and hear what they're saying. And I think that that's kind of how we're going to have to work our way through this to really understand holistically what is happening here. So thank you, Darren. Um, what we have to realise, to use a pop culture reference, we, that's Emily, that's me, and that's you, we are the Rebel Alliance. And if you watch George Lucas's saga Star Wars, the Empire is made up of everybody looking the same. And the Rebel Alliance is this ragtag on a shoestring army made up of all different diverse groups of people, be it aliens that look like fish, be it a huge big teddy bear, be it a black man with a gorgeous jerry curl afro and a cape. It's all a rebel alliance. So we are not the empire, we are not slick, 
and regimented and everyone's the same we are the yeah. ragtag and that's the joy of what we are so yep. this is what people have to realize and appreciate yeah absolutely all right now back to michael jackson well when the reason why people went mad for michael jackson is men are taught again going into programming to act and be in a certain way and that can be good that can be bad i know robert phoenix has very strong views on this but when you saw michael jackson dance it was not in an effeminate manner mm -hmm. but it was something unique you've never seen a man dance in that way in yeah. that expression and there is something around the importance of dance what I have found is, and I'll admit it, I live alone. And one of the things to entertain myself in this lockdown pandemic, is it a pandemic? That's another uh, thing for Randy to talk about. <laughs> but um, I have found myself suddenly dancing, listening to various music for a little bit in my room, in my small apartment. And the importance of dance is it actually has a positive impact. Uh, some people in the alternative seem to believe on human DNA. Mm -hmm. can actually upgrade our DNA. All physical activity is like you, as somebody that was involved in gymnastics. I'm sure you had times where you done a certain move and it felt like you were observing yourself doing yeah. it. And it was like, this is, this is quite matrixy to use a pop culture thing like how have i suddenly understood that when before i couldn't if the penny dropped and you and you you got it and you got a 10 or you got an observation from your coach or your fellow gymnast to go wow emily you really did that good and that's what the movement does it's part of like a martial art vibe yep. it, it's like you move and you do something in your body it's connected to your brain you've got a soul and then all the cogs are moving all the gears are moving in the one direction so that's why i think michael jackson had that approach prince on the other hand another good dancer but more a musician mm -hmm. and what it was to do with prince like michael jackson a man had never come with that before where he was talking about issues of lust issues of romantic love issues of religion and spirituality in some some very black eubonics in this disrespect call, calling the numbers i think it's called where people say your mama jokes and things like that so you have this man who was very well rounded but then dressed in this very strange, at times, effeminate way. And I think that's why, it, that's why people, especially women, just went crazy for him. So I think what, what it is to do with it is to do with what is a man, what is a person, what is identity, how is a person supposed to speak? And my last point, going to NPR, they've got a very interesting channel on YouTube called the Tiny Desk concerts and what it is for those who aren't aware of the tiny desk concerts they are in the studios of npr and people will come in and do acoustic versions of their songs three or four songs but when you look at the place where they actually do it it is so deliberately done hipster it's a work of art no office of a corporate entity as big as NPR would have an office like that, but they've deliberately, knowingly identified what hipsters like. Mm -hmm. and they've made a section of their corporate office to reflect that coziness of a hipster, and that what draws people in. So again, that's programming again, but on a visual level. Yeah, and what, and I'll, just even the idea that it's called the tiny desk, right? One of the things that we're dealing with with this 
kind of technology that we have is the reduction everything down to what you can see in a very small space, like on a small screen, right? Like, in, you know, it's amazing to me some of the things people are willing to watch on this little, little box, right? And so I know people who would rather watch a movie on their phone than on, on the television. So it's like bringing reality down to a specific size that they, they're trying to sort of affect things with that as well. But yeah, NPR is, is uh, it's, its own interesting beast, but that's an interesting observation that you make there, right? Like that idea of just sort of, you know, a, you can't really quite tell if this is like, a den in someone's house or, or an office kind of thing, right? I mean, I haven't seen this channel you're talking about, but I know what you're referring to in terms of like the sort of kind of space that the hipsters like, because there's a bunch of bars here in Los Angeles that are sort of like that, that are sort of somewhere between, look like they're sort of somewhere between a living room and office and like a place where you'd have your record collection or something like that, right? <laughs> So, <laughs> exactly. back, back to what you said about Michael Jackson and Prince and, and about dancing and movement and stuff. So like one of the things that, you know, Michael Jackson and Prince both had is they had this, they walked this very interesting line between masculinity and femininity, right? Like where the, some of the things they did were incredibly masculine. Some of the ways that they moved their body and the, the, um, self-assuredness that they had were our characteristics that one would consider fairly masculine, but they both presented their hair and their clothing and at times the pitch of their voice in a way that have often usually perceived as feminine. Um, there's a kind of balance, right? The balance between masculinity and femininity, and this can be, I'm talking about this like on an inner, in an inner way, not necessarily in terms of your outer appearance where there's like a really high form of creativity and spirituality and, and, and that kind of thing. And that's what sort of actually brings people like, ha, like magnetically draws people towards you. And they both had that, right? It's something, babies love symmetry, right? They love like physical symmetry. Like if you give them a picture to look at, they'll pick the faces, you know, that are the most symmetrical. And I'd say the same things goes for what we're attracted to energetically. Um, and, and in terms of like what we want to look at and when we're looking at art or whatever is that sort of inner symmetry, right? And they had, even though both of them seemed distorted in their own way, when you like step back, when they were in their elements, everything was perfectly symmetrical, right? Like everything just fit in perfectly. There was a perfect balance between male and female, between right brain and left brain, between all of this kind of stuff that is actually, you know, really, really important. And when they, you know, I can speak more um, towards Michael Jackson in this realm because his stuff was really more based on movement than Prince, although Prince had some moves himself. When you would watch Michael Jackson dance, it was outside of time. It didn't, it, it, it defied your normal understanding of like physics and it had a di like a dynamic element to it that sort of it's, and I've talked about this in relation to gymnastics as well and certain kinds of dancing where, you know, I talk about some popping and break dancing sometimes and whatnot, but like when people are attracted to watching the Olympics and gymnastics, they're always looking for that moment where like Simone Biles or whoever does a, a skill or a trick where they like float for a second where it looks like everything stops, right? Like they go really high on that one or where something happens that is like, hey, uh, grabs all your attention and it's often not the hardest skill it's often the skill where like time stops for a second because they're so high and they're floating above kind of like what you were saying almost like observing yourself outside of yourself right there's a moment where everybody's just like <gasps> and I've, I've watched it at gymnastics meets my whole life people you take them to a gymnastics meet they don't know anything about gymnastics I always can predict which move they're going to be really impressed by and it's never the hardest one, but it's the one that moves them outside of time for a second. People understand that like this thing that we deal with where we're sort of imprisoned by time and the rules related to it, that that isn't in some ways our natural state. And so when they see somebody achieve a moment of stopping time or getting outside of time, that takes their breath away. And I think that Michael Jackson certainly achieved that with his dancing and, and, and what you were talking about 
when you're dancing and you have a moment where you know you got like the rhythm just right, you kind of hit a move or an angle or whatever, where like something else opened up, right? Where for a second time stood still and you were like, you had an interesting thought or you just kind of like felt your position in reality different than you usually do. It's the same kind of thing. We can all experience it. Some people just have more fantastic flair when they do it, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically just like a lost in the moment yeah. type, type of vibe. And you, you get that, like one of the epic tennis games mm -hmm. was Roger Federer, Rafa Nadal when Wimbledon was going. Yeah, oh, that was amazing. Yeah. And it was, and it was going dusk. Yep. And they had this supernatural feel mm -hmm. because generally Wimbledon is very traditional. There's a dress code for both spectators and also for, for the players of the game. And because the light was dimming, people were mixed. People were like, surely we've got to end this and we've got to come back the next day on Monday. But because it was such epic tennis mm -hmm. and both were at their absolute peak, the referee or the umpire and the officials were like, no, this, ha this must continue. And, mm -hmm. it was, it, and, and even in the UK, there was like a debate after it because everyone, that's what made it so special. Mm -hmm. Wimbledon actually bent their own rules mm -hmm. around time and around the notion of like light within a game of tennis, which yeah. when you think about it, it's pretty important. Yep. Like you have to have a certain amount of light to see this ball that's going hundreds of miles an hour at times. So it's, it's sport has that element. And one of the things that um, I wanted to talk to you about a five points and that bridges about time. And I have been so professional I've even made notes. So, <laughs> but it's everything's linking together. Real, real quickly, before you get to your five points, I just want to say that was an epic match. And your point to how it had this sort of mystical feel because it was starting, it was dark, right? But there was a, it was, and there's not lights on the court at tennis because they suspend play there when it gets dark, unlike at the US Open or whatever. So there was enough energy being generated both from these two superhumans, but also from the crowd and the excitement that there was kind of still a glow around the court, almost like a dream sequence or whatever. Everything was a little hazy and misty, but those two were in such a state of like uh, adrenaline and like they were just in, in, in sync with what they were doing that nothing could stop them from seeing the ball. You know what I mean? It didn't matter. The things that normally would become issues in most tennis matches, would not neither one of these people were going to stop until this whatever it was was settled and it was i mean i can think of one or two other tennis matches i've ever watched that ever that came close to it you know but they were different that was a truly magical uh but from even just the visuals like it was almost looked like there was like gold flecks in the air sort of floating around it if you you remember what i'm talking about it was insane to watch yeah it was amazing so it all right it it reminded me of those paintings you see those um, late 19th, early 20th century oil paintings of King Arthur yep. and this court. The glow and, around. And yeah. it's done with gold leaf. I, I, yeah. I'm not an artist, I'm sorry, I, I'm not good with art history, but people, I'm sure Robert Phoenix would know as he knows everything. Or Chris, Chris Crimmy will know what it is because she likes to paint and stuff like that, I think, so. And yeah. it did have this very um, beautiful, surreal feeling. So now we're talking about media and we're talking about time and how the media impacts people. And what I have noticed is there have been at least five things within this pandemic lockdown that have really got into people's hearts. All right. The major pop culture events. And I will break them down why I feel from talking to people, um, safe distancing, when you do either on public transport or at a queue of a supermarket, why these things have impacted people. So the first major pop culture events of this pandemic lockdown all started in the UK on Friday the 23rd of March. Okay. And round about the same time was something called Netflix, 
known as Tiger King. Mm -hmm. And Tiger King is a outstanding look at levels of sociopathic manipulation and the use of animals, endangered animals, that these various levels of sociopaths use on very damaged, vulnerable people. Okay. And another surprising element of Tiger King was its notion of sex and how that plays in our contemporary age. But the big reason why it really connected the cherry on the cake was because it was about animals that were confined to a mm. space and people during the lockdown felt the symmetry like they felt with the animals. Okay, so I have, I'm, I'm aware that there was a big thing with Tiger King, but I've actually never seen it and I'm not even 100% clear what it is. So can you tell me a little bit about it? I understand your points about it, but can you just give me a little background on what it is? A Tiger King is a, a documentary about the trade of exotic rare animals within the United States of America. Okay. Its main character or anti-hero is a man called Joe Exotic, who is um, damaged as a child because he is gay and he's from Oklahoma, so a very ultra male environment. Mm -hmm. And then he decides to suddenly like Willy Wonka, I'm just going to have an exotic menagerie in the middle of uh, Oklahoma and just uh, have a purpose to my life. But then what he quickly, what he quickly realises is that because he has had pain in his life, he then can see pain in certain others. And then to get a feeling of strength, he manipulates people to um, get what he wants mm -hmm. but then it gets worse and worse with his ambitions at one time he wants to run to be president of America then that dilutes to being governor of Oklahoma and it just means that he then has to meet other more sophisticated sociopaths in the same type of interest one of the individuals um, is actually the inspiration for the film Scarface okay. and, the and the character Tony Montana. And this guy basically states that the reason he not only had the passion to have exotic animals, which then led to him becoming a big time drug dealer to pay for his passion, was that his mother um, banned him as a child from having any type of pets mm -hmm. so this is the second person that has had childhood trauma and then we get to uh, the most mysterious person a woman called carol baskin who in episode three they have a reconstruction of the first date she had with her husband that got her into this exotic animal game and it is the most surreal first date you will ever see. I had to watch this 10 minute sequence twice to make sure I was processing what they were saying. Yeah. What happened. <clears throat> and then it went to the real Carol Baskin. And then she was verifying what actually you would just see. And I'm like, this woman has got issues. And again, Carol <laughs> Baskin has childhood trauma. Yeah. So, so it's a very interesting thing about weak people that want to be strong, that get animals so they can be dominant over animals mm -hmm. and then use that to then manipulate people who are more damaged than them. So everybody in it doesn't come out great. There's no hero in it. And it's just a very interesting look at sociopathic behaviour in people. Interesting. I, when you're talking about this, it made me think of another case that brought up a lot of issues around sociopathic people. I don't know if you remember the whole thing that happened with the guy named Andrew Cunanan who ended up killing Gianni Versace. 
I think yes, I remember they had a dramatization about that recently. Yeah, I don't. I didn't know that there was one recently, but I followed it closely while it was happening because uh, Andrew Cunanan actually uh, reminded me of somebody that I knew in my own life, um, and this was a person who had been made fun of when he was a child by his father for being gay, like he was gay and Filipino. So th at that period of time, you know, he felt bad about, you know, not being like the other kids in his class and whatever. And he'd been, I guess, effeminate as a kid and the dad made fun of him. And so he kind of <clears throat> grew up and became, um, you know, like sort of a con artist who manipulated old gay men who wanted things that they couldn't have and, you know, that kind of stuff. And he went on this spree of killing these gay men who he would have affairs with right and sort of live the high life with them for a period of time and then do something horrible and this series of things took him across the country and ultimately landed him in, you know in front of johnny versace's palace you know or, or whatever and he waited and stalked him and killed him you know and whatnot and you know then went and killed himself in a boat or whatever it was but it was the same kind of thing about a person who, who had felt pain, finding other people who had felt, also felt pain and manipulating them and putting a big display of psychopathic behavior on. But you know, it was a similar, it sounds like a similar, I mean, obviously people and animals are somewhat different, but what you're talking about is manipulating other people and then basically imprisoning and torturing you know, sort of animals on a certain level, but it is interesting how this happens, right? A lot of this early trauma around gender and sexuality and manliness or, or, or whatever, that kind of thing, really um, damages people in a way that sets up a whole lifetime of pain for a lot of people. It is, and it was just interesting where you have this pop culture ph phenomenon where all different people who you, you presume that wouldn't have an interest in it or wouldn't get the themes and notions, not to be snobbish. Right. But you just think this person likes very basic stuff, uh, American football, soccer, a, a novella, just very ba basic entertainment. And they immediately got the themes of Tiger King on a very deep level. Mm -hmm. So it's had a very therapeutic, impact on pop culture i would say all over the world mm. so i would very much recommend uh, watching the old eight episodes i believe all eight episodes are an hour in length so okay. it, is a it is it is a dedication but you can do it over a couple of days yeah now, the next one is season three of westworld mm -hmm. which was beautiful epic Whereas the other two seasons were very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. What they've done with this is they've given you the reward for sticking with the season. <laughs> and, <laughs> and because of it being Christopher Nolan's brother, mm -hmm. there's an issue around the thing of time. Yep. Like we've spoken before recently. And what you can do with Westworld season three, if you've never seen it, you could watch season three in chronological episode order, then watch season two again in chronological episode order, and then watch season one. And you could enjoy watching it in that manner, or you could watch it season one, season two, season three. Yeah, I can go either way, yeah. And it was about the notion of tech billionaires collecting vast amounts of data mm -hmm. on humanity and then using that to create a, a utopia that they believed was in their image. And one of the interesting things within Westworld, they were putting a very hidden in plain sight and sonic reference because the first AI machine was known as Solomon, mm -hmm. and then the more refined AI machine was named after the son of Solomon in the Bible, Ro Roabam. And Roabam in the Bible and in within the Jewish text, whilst he didn't have all of his father's wisdom, he looked at his father's errors and mistakes 
and then he had that genetic wisdom that was passed down given from God and he actually was a better ruler than his father so and the Freemasonic order their number one hero they pin, pin up the person that they pin on their wall is King Solomon, Solomon yeah because he was given knowledge as it says in the biblical text by God but then he then stated, well, why can't I be as equal as God and know all things? So he took the wisdom and he tried to back engineer dark occultic knowledge, but then combine that to then create balance with the good knowledge, to then try to create balance between good and evil. So this is where the black and the white come from, from mm -hmm. Freemasonry, from King Solomon. So Westworld season three was very enjoyable fun Aaron Paul who we know was in Breaking Bad mm -hmm. he was I he was good in Breaking Bad but he was superb in this mm -hmm. about a man who was downtrodden who was manipulated brainwashed by the state and then his rage and then his hopes for the future and it's all set in Los Angeles, so that's very personal for you. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it's climactic, without giving a spoiler, is in the city of Dubai. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it's the Nolan saying that the future will come from that place, Dubai. So if you've not watched um, any Westworld and you're just in lockdown and you're just saying, what can I do? I would strongly recommend Westworld, particularly season three. So season three brings together a lot of things that we've all talked about in alternative media for a long time. I think season three for a lot of people was a love it or, or a hate it, but you're right. It is a vastly different visual and just sort of aesthetic experience than the first two seasons. Um, let me see if I, how I want to sort of go about addressing some of this. Um, I think he did a good job of summarizing it. Uh, I find Aaron Paul quite interesting. He's, um, there's actually quite a bit of connection between the character he plays here and the character he played on Breaking Bad. Um, one of the things I like to track with certain actors, because I think people think of them as, oh, they're actors, they're acting in a role, this, and they go to a movie and they do something else. But certain actors, if you pay attention to the course of their career, and the, the roles that they've chosen and the connection between those roles, you're seeing that there's something they're trying to say or there's something that is trying to be expressed through the, what's being woven throughout, almost as if it's the arc of one great character throughout time as opposed to various different characters in the different movies or television shows. And um, the, one of the things with Aaron Paul and, and his characters, you know, he, when we think of, of Jesse from Baking, I still call him Jesse. I, I forget to call him Caleb and whatever. You know, he was identified with this blue methamphetamine that he and, um, you know, uh, what's his name? Walter um, White. Yeah, Walter White, Hank, or what was Walter White, Heisenberg, or whoever they were, Walter White, that they were making and tracking. And, you know, you, there's other references to this throughout media, particularly in the film Lucy that I just watched as well right that you know she took this blue she was dosed with this blue crystalline kind of drug that gave her superhuman powers and <clears throat> a lot of the things that i've talked about as i've recounted some of my experience which is with drugs and with the sugar as programmable matter series and whatnot is that at this point we're dealing with drugs that are sort of programmed and digital in nature and that the um Blue meth in Breaking Bad, there really was blue meth. There was blue meth here in Los Angeles in the late 90s and early 2000s. And I would put that as something that, that, was a, that happened during a period of time where drugs were going from what I called being analog to being more digital in nature um, and the meth included. It changed. It was a different experience after that. And the blue meth came during that period of time. And I think it's something that was used largely to track what was happening with the uh, people that were using that particular strain of meth. Same like ecstasy that had particular names would, like you might go uh, to a party in this area and all the ecstasies would be Mitsubishis and somewhere else it would be <laughs> Rolexes and whatever. But they know 
what people, people talk about that. So they know these people have done this and now we're observing their behavior and we're seeing what, because these are programmed drugs and the same thing with the blue mat. And um, th these drugs are also used quite a bit in projects and programs, MKUltra kind of thing. And these things do certain things to your brain that make it operate in a different way that people think of, okay, that goes for while you're on the drug, but I think some of these have a more long-term transformation that happens with your brain. And some of them aren't necessarily, you know, people think of like drug addicts as being dropped out, not able to use their brains well. My experience when I've done them was, that's not true. The, your brain actually is operating at a super high level when you're on these drugs. It's what you do to yourself while you're on the drugs that makes your body and your brain and whatever stop, start to fall apart. The not sleeping, the not eating, the not drinking enough water, the not taking care of yourself. That's actually what causes the degradation, not the actual chemicals themselves. And this is not me saying that they're good for you, but they're, being, they're, they're, they're accomplishing a very certain task. And some of the ways that I was able to put information together during this time are like still inform how I assess information that people find interesting and that I'm able to connect dots in a certain way. And I may always, always have had that talent, but it was certainly amplified in some way during that period of time. And, you know, and uh, it definitely caused me to see things from a different angle. Um, and so Jesse is one character in, in, in Breaking Bad who's been exposed to this blue meth. And then he shows up as this Caleb here who's got sort of now <clears throat> a life in this very futuristic world that requires him to sort of um, be able to find a way to match wits with people of tremendous technological capability, right? And so he's obviously on a certain level, you know, a project kid, right? He's dealing with cyborgs and clones and people that have access to all this technology, but, you know, he is on a certain level, what would have been referred to at a certain time as, you know, like a super soldier type, right? Like he was using all of those kinds of, you know, you see in the, in the flashbacks and whatnot. So, and at certain points, you see that he also has technology in his mouth. He has that sort of implant on the top of his mouth that they would al alternately use to torture him and to, or to give him abilities. He's been altered by the experiences and the things that he's taken. So, you know, you saw them taking those limbic drugs when they would be there, right? Like, I, you know, I think this is happening already. I think that's kind of what I'm talking about with ecstasy. Those are programmed drugs. So for some, you know, like, there's also people who consider themselves highly evolved, really smart people that are taking these program drugs as well as an upgrade, but they have a full understanding of what they are. Of what they are. If you listen to people who have brought us our computers, our internet, our technology, all of them will tell you about, how, you know, that they use psychedelics during the time well, that micro, they were developing. Micro, micro dosing, and that's the difference between um, educated, affluent people Mm -hmm. And also working class people, the affluent people take drugs as a, um, a leisure time experience. Mm -hmm. And the poorer person takes it as an antidepressant mm -hmm. to basically get out of their poverty or their misery or their lack mm -hmm. of income. And it's two different experiences. I've seen it a lot with um, various people I've encountered there attitude sometimes taking the same substance mm -hmm. and one views it as like a glass of wine and the other one views it as a constant yeah and it's very very interesting to see that division but westworld season three is a must the next one yeah is a disney production uh, known as the clone wars I want to hit one more, th one more thing on, on Westworld because you brought it up in terms of Los Angeles before I move on. It was shot mostly in, in downtown Los Angeles, which was where I was living during the most chaotic period of my life where a lot of this kind of stuff was happening in the mind control sort of sense and space for me. So seeing it, um, seeing on the screen what I was aware energetically was, was already happening downtown eight, eight, 10 years ago you know, there to see it like come to fruition in the outer world as opposed to in the underground where I was experiencing it was uh, quite interesting. Um, yeah, it, it was really quite interesting. And to your point about Dubai, 
if you think about what the United Arab Emirates or the Dubai and all that stuff is, it is like a simulated world because they have all those little islands that are the different countries of the world, right? They have like their own little mini world there. It's like bizarre, right? So it's kind of a, a simulation of the world. So it's not surprising that they're guiding the world out of this simulated place. And Robert Phoenix is giving me a transmission from time and space. And he is telling me that one of the leaders of the rebellion that was helping Caleb was retired NFL player Marshawn Lynch. Ah. He played for the my team, the Seattle Seahawks, who Robert hates. And um, <laughs> <laughs> he does hate them. <laughs> And I love them. And then um, he played for his hometown team, the Oakland Raiders. Yeah. And he's from the Bay Area, which is very rebellious. So mm -hmm. it was very interesting that a player who had immense physical strength was brought into his very first acting role mm -hmm. to play somebody that was virtually, he could immediately slip into that anti-authoritarian yep. vibe of Oakland combined with his physical raw strength so that was great casting just to see him in yep. that role as yeah, well yeah yeah so the next so as i said um the next one next point. is the clone wars final season what was bizarre disney had a great animated series known as the clone wars which was in between the um the the recent three remakes that was um, The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith and The Clone Wars deals with Anakin Skywalker's eventual journey to be Darth Vader mm -hmm. and the final season uh, for some reason Disney dropped it, it was immensely popular and then last year they announced that they were going to conclude it and it was coming out around about March 2020. And the whole notion of the Clone Wars deals with the notion of betrayal by political heroes. Mm -hmm. So in the Star Wars um, world, uh, Palpatine is seen as a hero of the people, but he is actually the mastermind villain. Mm -hmm. Then gives the order to the clone troopers to then turn on the Jedi and then massacre the Jedi. And linking with that yesterday, President Trump announced yep. that he would order the US military mm -hmm. to vaccinate the entire population of America. Yep. So all the QAnon heads don't know what to do. Yep. Because they're like, well, he's our savior. Right, Why I don't, is he not getting the military to vaccinate? Uh, what, 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 what dimension are they going to have to go to to assess this chess move? Right, they always say, oh, he's doing fifth dimensional chess or twelve dimensional dimensional chess or whatever. But yeah, no, I've actually not ever seen any of the Star Wars movies, but I understand sort of the what you're getting at here, and your point to that is exactly right. That that is what we're seeing here is that, and we're it doesn't even matter which side you're on. Right, right now, the raw, naked behavior of our political figures is on complete display if you're willing to pay any attention. And everybody is turning on the people that supported them. Everybody. And, and it was very interesting to see at this time, it's very, the synchronization of it was amazing mm -hmm. because it deals with um, the main character isn't actually Anakin Skywalker. It's a Jedi who's his Padawan. A Sanko Tano, mm -hmm. maybe I've got that wrong. Sorry, Star Wars geeks. And she um, realizes that her former master has basically joined the dark side, and it deals with her guilt and loss are around their former um, hero betraying her. So it was very uh, synchronistic with um, Trump now standing next to Fauci. And we know Fauci's got links with the uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton Foundation and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well. Mm -hmm. So people in the Q side and the MAGA side are like, well, why is he standing with them if they're actually the total opposite to him? So it was very synchronistic. Yep. Those eight good episodes. catch. Yeah, good catch. 
And then the next one is about a, an athlete and his name is Dejan Lovren and he currently plays for my beloved Liverpool Football Club. All right. As well as being a player for the Croatian national men's soccer team. Oh, that's and interesting. He's Croatian. Okay. And he used his Twitter account, which then he quickly deleted after about two hours to go after Bill Gates. And he basically, I believe, put a video with David Icke. And then he said on his tweet, to, I'm paraphrasing to an effect, we basically know who you are, Bill, and nobody likes you. Yeah. And that, that just went viral on Twitter, social media. Well, when we were preparing to do this, you sent me something in the Facebook Messenger with a picture of him. I'd never heard of him before. And I somehow missed this because now that you're saying he deleted his, his Twitter after that. Um, so I wasn't sure who he was, but I had a feeling I knew what you were going to say. Uh, it's interesting that he's Croatian because really the only other athlete who has gone after this is Novak Djokovic, who is number one in the world. We've previously talked about him, who has said that he is not he may not play again if they say he has to take a vaccine he's serbian so it's kind of interesting that from that section of the world we have people who are really willing to uh, go to bat put their money where their mouth is and 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 say some things that all of the uh more um favored well-loved blah 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 american athletes this and that or or the famous international athletes are unwilling to say in fact most of them take sponsorship or have charities with bill gates and all, you know roger federer has a charity with bill gates you know what i mean so you know everyone's like oh but roger federer he's so likable he's such a nice guy and people just don't like Djokovic as much but you know what like when it comes down to what actually matters and and people's uh, freedom to choose for themselves it's interesting that these lesser known athletes or at least you know I, I can't speak for the soccer world or whatever but some of these athletes who aren't the ones you hear about as much as the others are really standing up strong it's funny that they're both from that part of the world these parts of the world that have been taken over by foundations and whatnot many many times right and i've got another transmission of robert phoenix in the future watching this transmitting it into my temple and he is saying Maria Abramovic yep. is also from the same part of the world. Yep. So there is so, and one of the things I realised a few years ago, David Eich was interviewed, uh, I think, three times on Croatian national television. I remember that. Yeah. So there is some sort of deep interest in the mystic going on in the form of Yugoslavia. Maybe it has yep. some energy where it does have its Jedis and it does have its Siths. Yeah. And um, it naturally produces these type of people who've got this maybe awareness out of time. Yeah. And they know more of the fuller picture. Isn't, so isn't, they, isn't that where Tesla's from as well originally? Isn't that where his, uh, his heritage is from? Yeah, he's from Bel... I believe he's from... Belgrade. No, he, no, he would be... Serbian, but I believe it was Bosnia Herzegovina, what we call it today. Okay. He was from, but then he eventually like made his fortune and his impact in Belgrade through education. Uh -huh. So, so Dejan Lovren still got his Instagram, but he hasn't got his Twitter. And like according to what was being talked about, because of his age, um, he was actually going to move to Italy. So I think he feels a sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, my transfer from Liverpool has already been secured, so I'm going to use my platform being playing still for one of the biggest soccer clubs or one of the biggest professional sports franchises in the world to put this forward. Yeah, so, good on him. Yeah. So it's very interesting. And the club, interestingly, never came out in any type of censor against them, where they would have said very corporate and bland. The views of Dejan Lovren are not necessarily those of Liverpool Football Club, its owners or its players or its staff. The yeah. club never did that. So that was very interesting from the club not to actually condemn him. So that was very interesting. And then the last point... The, a the ATP didn't condemn Djokovic either. In fact, uh, there I have one aspect of the conversation I'm 
you know, saving to talk about with Robert on the next MASH. But I w they, Tennis Now, which is one of the little like tennis news things that's on YouTube or whatever, they actually presented a really fair assessment of like what he said and, and whatnot. It, it, it was, I was actually surprised that there hasn't really been um, a statement from the ATP or from you know, various uh, sponsors of his that say that they are in, in that they don't agree. It's kind of interesting. So go ahead. Uh, the fifth one is about the death of Little Richard. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is a big belief and people might disagree, which is your choice, that Little Richard is the most important individual of these past 100 years, 1920 to 2020. And the reason why I believe this is because before Little Richard music, was very bland. Was he 100 when he died? No, he wasn't, oh. but I believe that. Okay, I, I, I thought you were saying he lived from 1920 to 2020. I was like, no, really? I, okay. no, I'm, just, I'm just using that gotcha. timeline okay. uh, just to be grandiose, just to make gotcha. myself look clever. Please do, I do it all the time. Very good. <laughs> Let me just put a pen behind my ear to make my look so smart. So, the, so uh, what the reason why I believe Little Richard was so important was before he, he came, music was very bland. It was jazz, but it was done in a very controlled manner known as trad jazz, which would be based on like ballroom dancing mm -hmm. using jazz. And then you had this man who had a very elaborate way of playing the piano. He would put, for instance, his his foot on the piano, sorry, his foot on the piano, showing yeah. my leg, and he would then start playing the piano, he would jump, he would scream in a very effeminate way, and sometimes in a very masculine way, and it just drew America. John Lennon said that when he was a child, he heard Long Tall Sally, and it actually made him cry tears of joy. Because from that moment, he realized what he wanted to be. And he wanted to recreate that reaction in others. And from Little Richard, we get Jerry Lee Lewis. We also get Elvis Presley. We get James Brown. We get Parliament Funkadelic. We get Marvin Gaye. We get Billy Joel, Elton John. Lady Gaga even today. Well, Prince I think, I think, but I think we even get Prince and Michael Jackson on a certain level from Little Richard. Certainly, I mean, he was one of the earliest ones to present that sort of combined masculine, feminine, alternate sort of kind of thing, right? Even though his music was very different than theirs, that, you know, shrieking like this, you know, like kind of like Michael Jackson did the, the you know, in the presentation. But I would say that, you know, like, his influence was felt was, you know, led to them as well, you know? So yeah, I mean, I see your connection there. I can't say that I'm super, um, uh, like that, that, I mean, m maybe because a lot of the music that I've liked and listened to was influenced by him. I've never listened to a lot of Little Richard. I did notice in the news that day that I saw that he had died and it caught my attention and I thought that was interesting. I thought that was an unusual thing to have happen. For some reason, I was like, that's weird that that's happening. This is happening right now. Like, you know, he's very, um, he represents very human music, whereas the music nowadays is very robotic. You know what mm. I mean? So a certain, a death of a certain kind of swagger that came with that kind of music and a certain kind of presence and whatnot, it just is not, you don't see it very often anymore. Um, and yeah, it's interesting. Go on. What was interesting was when you were just talking about Little Richard, I sense with my Jedi mind powers using my lightsaber that you actually wanted to do a shriek. Mm -hmm. Something in you didn't want to because you want to look professional. So, <laughs> I'm to, so I'm going to give you the opportunity to give us an impression of a little Richard shriek. I just don't know if I can make my voice go that high. Just do it. Just be free. I can't and... do it. I can't do it. You do it. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> there's only so much I'm willing to embarrass myself with you know what I mean I'll go pretty far out there but I'm not going that far out there well was my Jedi powers right with my lightsaber yeah yeah. Did did of, yeah 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 
So yeah, so it was just a very important individual that changed our lives, our attitude, how we how we how we express ourselves. The song is breakout song, my favourite is called Long Tall Sally. And it's a brilliant word play in which it's about a house party in obviously an African American neighbourhood that a little Richard is is observing and his uncle John goes to the back alley to meet Long Tall Sally, who is actually a transvestite prostitute. Oh, interesting. And his uncle John knows this, but he then, um, somebody, I think little Richard d discovers the, um, the little romantic thing between Uncle John and Long Tall Sally, and then sort of just uh, exposes them. And then that's where the shriek comes from, where he recreates the shriek of ah. Long Tall Sally being found out. And then his Uncle John is shocked round his nephew, which is little Richard in the song, discovering his actual sexual preference. Yeah. So it, but it was very interesting because for that time in America to have segregation and then have a black man talking about very deep, kinky, hidden things. Yeah. That, to, that today is still hidden and it's to be an absolute worldwide smash. Yeah. It shows you the genius of the man. So I would recommend just maybe listening on YouTube or buying, maybe go to Amoeba Records when that hopefully is open down on Sunset. Yeah. And uh, just get the best of Little Richard and um, listen to his other word play. There's a wonderful interview that he had with a British um, music expert known as Jules Holland in the 1990s in which he was talking about his autobiography and it was about him missing participating in orgies but then also now his new love for Jesus and being born again and the host Jules Holland being typically British couldn't like deal with like <laughs> sex and the pleasure of sex and he thought he was talking he's going to talk about meeting Elvis and Mick Jagger and Bob Marley and he's saying no he said even though I found Jesus I still miss those orgies they were <laughs> and he was like oh okay here's the book all right there's the book yeah you can buy it okay then all right all right that's the yeah, people check that out you know that the other thing that Little Richard may have been one of the first to really bring was that just electrified, frenetic, energetic style. Like things were more muted, you know, maybe before him. And he has that all encompassing energy, whether you like it or hate it, hate it you can't not pay attention to it, you know? And, and I think that was the first time we saw that maybe on full display. And of course there's been a few characters since then that sort of embody that same kind of passion and energy. But yeah, that, I think he, that- he, he is the blueprint of all popular music after it. I see basically every popular worldwide star in music has something common in. And it's a shame um, because Elvis gets a lot of plaudits, but it's something deeper in our society, which is a completely other episode yeah, yeah. we've got to talk about, which is about why black people are not acknowledged for their achievements but then openly and and welcoming in terms of criticism people can't criticize black people enough when they do something wrong or when they do something right it gets muted so that's an, that's another interesting thing so um i would love to thank you for this i've been wanting for years to speak <laughs> to you um my friend the late Tracy Twyman and I still have no idea for all those people that are fr who are friends of Tracy or fans of Tracy or have her books I have no idea how Tracy passed there seems to be this wall that is surrounding me getting that information I've even called the funeral home last year where Tracy 
in Hades, uh, the sun where she is, she is rest in peace, where her grave is. And it was a very, very awkward conversation that they had with me that obviously they had to protect the family's confidentiality. But then they realised this guy with a strange accent from the UK is talking with a lot of feeling about his, his connection to Tracy. So I still don't know what is going on. There are certain people I could push buttons at and try to get something from. But my attitude is maybe Tracy was involved in something that maybe I shouldn't know about. And maybe those individuals are actually protecting me by not telling me. So I don't know what's going on, Emily, but I hope uh, Tracy, wherever she is, whatever dimension she is, she can somehow come back to this realm and hopefully she it will enjoy this conversation. So again, thank you for having me. Well, I'm going to ask you if you would stay with me so we can move over and do a quick uh, patron segment so you and I can talk a little bit about more of me. You, more you of want you. more of yeah, me. It, was, it wasn't painful. So uh, <laughs> I would like to move over into the patron segment and uh, explore Westworld from a different aspect and talk a little bit about uh, dance music and the rave scene and a few things that we didn't get to hit on in the first hour. If you'll, can, okay? I give my, can I give my um, Twitter stuff and everything? You do it now, yeah. And I also have some things I want to say about Tracy in the second hour. But yes, give your, get, let people know where they can find you, and uh, all, then we'll move over. For all those people that haven't got the money, but anyway, <laughs> oh, um, no. if you want to, because because she because this lady gives us her soul every time, and I think she deserves a little remuneration so she can get uh, more stuff off Amazon to make her forget about the crisis. <laughs> but anyway, my uh, Twitter account, I am on Twitter. It's Daz Alt Fairy. That's all one word. That's fairy as in science, not as in Tinkerbell. So you can give me a tweet. Hopefully it will be in the description box below. Okay. I've always wanted to say that. And get in contact with me for anything. Um, what I will try to do, as I'm a networker, I love networking people. My last point, there is a wonderful woman called Eleanor Conway that I would like you, Emily, to consider to interview in the future. All and right. She has a lot of symmetry with you, and I will contact Eleanor and to make that happen. So thank you for having me. And now we go to the real juicy stuff. <laughs> All right, guys. Get on this That's right. Thank you for joining us. If you would like to hear the rest of the conversation, go to patreon.com forward slash off planet media, and we will see you on the other side. Thank you very much.